What a rich time of worship through song, uh, prophetic encouragement from uh, the pages of Daniel, and meditation on the Lord's Supper uh, together. I hope that translates through the the, uh, broadcast but it definitely translates uh, in the presence of God's people, which is what I find in the scripture, that when God's people gather, following CDC guidelines, he gathers with them to bless. So thank you for all of you who have been serving us this morning and leading us this morning and encouraging us, and um, my soul is full. And I want to welcome back, particularly those of you who are joining us for the first time. Welcome back. We're glad you're here. And uh, we're excited each week to see some new faces, even as uh, different people are away, perhaps, for um, vacation. My name's Bauer, by the way, if you're joining us. Um, I have a high school reunion later today on Zoom, and I'm suspecting some of my high school companions who are still perplexed how I'm a pastor uh, may be on. So I hope you're on the ride here today. I'll see you at uh, four o'clock. I've been asked to give a couple of announcements. Um, and so um, first, thank you for your faithful, and I do mean this, steady giving to this church. Um, we have observed uh, during the pandemic that whereas in past summers we have seen volatility in our giving for a variety of reasons, we've seen a steady uh, amount of giving. And that means so much to your pastors, uh, not only as we try to be wise stewards of what God's providing, but also prayerfully seek the Lord for what we're to do with the property next door. And that's what the bank looks at too, steady, faithful giving. So thank you for doing that. You can continue to give online or drop some in the basket um, if you brought a check today. And we thank God for you for that. We have a baptism coming up on Sunday, August 9th. Is that right? It's going to take place in the baptismal, but after the service, uh, we have one individual that has approached us at once to be baptized. Another family has expressed interest too. We're waiting to confirm if they're available to us. So um, it's invited to all uh, to join us. So that will take place after the service. If you have questions about that, you can see Dave um, or Dan or I. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this morning, parents of, of children and children's ministry, Erin emailed you. She pushed out a survey. It's a two-question survey. Two questions. Say it with me. Two questions. That means it takes two minutes for you to open the email and to answer those two questions, uh, the staff met with me this past week, and we're trying to plan in the event that the governor, which we hope he does, uh, allows us to regather with, in children's ministry this fall. We're trying to plan ahead, and so we need those two questions answers. Teachers and helpers, you're included in that survey. I believe yours is the second question as well. So if you'd be so kind as to answer that, even dare I say it before I begin the sermon. Um, And then this week, we'll look at your responses, follow up with you. Ted, Aaron, or I will follow up with you, um, those we haven't heard from, and uh, and then uh, plan, begin our planning process. So thanks for doing that. We look forward uh, to ministering to your children uh, this fall, per the government's governor's uh, permission. Uh, There is a new children's ministry lesson. Uh, It was uh, online, so if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see that Abby has prepared another instant classic lesson on worshiping the Lord Jesus. When I saw the plant, the Jesus is Lord poster, and you, I'm in. I'm in. So I haven't yet had a chance to watch the whole thing, but uh, it's must-see TV, so stream that. Okay, and it's free too. Okay, Uh, please open in your Bibles. (laughs) It's great to be together. I hope you feel in my informality, my joy to be with you face to face. That is sincere joy. And I look forward to the day when we can all be together safely and uh, in one place. We're continuing our series on the parables of the kingdom, and we are in Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, 
beginning in verse 36. Jesus, while uh, spending an evening in the home of Simon the Pharisee, uh, shares a parable uh, with Simon and those gathered, and that is going to be our parable uh, today, uh, the parable of the two debtors. So let me pray, and then we'll read Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36 to the end of the chapter. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the particular passage before us, the parable of the two debtors. Lord, for any whom this this story is new, Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak through me clearly that they can not only uh, follow the the story, but more importantly, uh, deepen in their understanding of who Jesus is, what the kingdom of God is and was that he came to bring, and how it changes everything today. And for us, Lord, whom, whom this is a familiar story, may the parable still pack the punch of a surprising reversal of our expectations. Lord, may it speak into the the crevices of our souls where those thieves that seek to rob our joy of the gospel and its grace, Lord, that it would be confronted by the truth and your presence, that, Lord, we would find fresh, fresh mercy, new faith, new abilities even to be disciples of this kingdom for your glory. Join us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter seven, this is God's word. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him and he went into the Pharisee's home and reclined at table and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner When she learned that Jesus was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Verse 41. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my hair with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. From the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This concludes the reading of God's word. 
the parables of the kingdom. That's what we called this series because that is what Jesus was heralding when he began to tell these stories, these short and memorable stories that Luke has preserved for us in the gospel. You remember last week we looked at the parable of the sower or the soils that Jesus told that story as he was proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. Therefore, we've called these the parables of the kingdom because these short and memorable stories reveal for the disciples and for we, its modern day readers, the kingdom of God that Jesus came to inaugurate. It also reveals the king of which we have sung already to Jesus, the king of kings. And it also often contains a surprise, both for the original listeners, the audience, and for we, as these parables unveil, if you will, reveal mysteries, meaning they take expectations that we often would have of God or his kingdom, and they flip them upside down. Nowhere is this more evident than in this story, true story, of a dinner Simon the Pharisee had, where Jesus was presumably one of the honored guests, and an uninvited guest, a woman whose reputation was well known, a prostitute perhaps, comes to the dinner as well. If I were to summarize what I believe is the main point of the parable of the two debtors that we just read, it's this. As we comprehend the debt God has forgiven us through faith in Christ, we love God and others more earnestly. As we comprehend the debt, that's the language of the parable, a parable of two debtors whose debts are canceled. As we comprehend the debt God has forgiven us through faith in Christ, we love God and we love others more earnestly. Maybe you're new to the scripture or you're more familiar with the scriptures and you don't think in terms of your relationship with God that you owe him a debt that needs to be canceled. Well, you do and it's great and this parable wants to settle accounts with both of us through what is disclosed here. As we begin to look at the story again, my first point this morning is that the woman, this uninvited guest, the woman reminds us that the power of gospel forgiveness is the basis of our love for Christ and others. This woman reminds us of the power of forgiveness through faith in Christ, which is the basis of our love for God and others. Let's look at the story again. It's interesting, isn't it, as Luke has recorded this for us, that in the passage immediately preceding it, in answering John the Baptist's followers about who he is and through what he's done, assuring them that he is God's chosen one, the Messiah, he says this right before we read about Simon's dinner. For John the Baptist came eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by your children. Welcome to Simon the Pharisee's dinner party. For reasons not quite clear in the text, 
Jesus is invited by Simon into his home for dinner. It helps to know something about dinner parties in this day that are different from your parties, your, your dinner table, if you will, in our day. In biblical times, a home like what Simon would have, a reputable church leader, a community leader, perhaps, perhaps with some degree of affluence, homes in those days, scholars tell us, would have an open floor plan. And a Pharisee like Simon would host this party and his guests in a courtyard. So the meal itself would have been a semi-public occasion. And even though the guests he invited would be seated, they would be literally, I don't know how to describe it, but there are no chairs there. They're, they're sitting on the, the, the floor with their, their legs extended behind them, leaning onto the table. Although the, the guests he invited would be seated at the table, it was not uncommon for people who were not invited to the dinner to stop by, to listen in, to see who's there to sit around the edge of the courtyard and see if they could glean a a choice morsel of gossip or news or... See, there was TMZ even back in the days of biblical times. What was not so common was a woman like this to show up at a house like this and do what she did for Jesus. We do not know our name, Many speculate that it was Mary Magdalene, but there's no reason to think that it was from this passage. Others say it was a woman from Bethany, but that was something that happened much later in Jesus' ministry at a different place and with different results. You can read about that in Matthew 26. The only thing we know is that when she entered the room, Luke says this, Behold, some translations, a woman from the city. Behold, a woman with a reputation. Or, because it's repeated three times in the passage we just read, a sinner. A sinner. Luke records that, the Pharisee says that about her, and Jesus himself acknowledges it. People assume she was a prostitute. They may be right. Luke describes her as someone off of the streets, which may give the connotation of sexual morality. But in a way, it doesn't matter, does it? Because a sinner is a sinner. Someone who's living their life in rebellion to God and his ways. So whether, as Phil Riken wrote, she was a gossip or a call girl, she was in need of a savior. And she came to see Jesus, didn't she? Sinful as she was, she knew what Luke records others have said about this man, that Jesus was a friend of sinners. His friendship has been apparent throughout chapter 7, hasn't it? Where he's shown compassion to a Gentile centurion and his sick servant, where he's raised from the dead a, a, a widow's son as he's shown through miraculous healings and deliverance ministry uh, to the crowds in confirming his identity to John the Baptist. This man, Jesus, is a friend of sinners who can do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Each of these stories describes a need that they have that God alone can meet. And it is precisely because of this that the woman's actions rivets our attention. She heard that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house. She comes into the the dining room, if you will, there in the open courtyard with her perfume perhaps hoping to worship him. And at first, where she may have simply stood there, her tears begin to flow in his presence and fall down on his feet. 
And so as she couldn't control those emotions, she kneels down and with her hair, lets down her hair and begins to wipe up the tears. Now in those days, I'm told, women letting down their hair in public was not considered. It wouldn't fit Emily Post's directions for how you attend a party at a Pharisee's house. It was considered loose living. And not only was she crying, and not only was she using her now loosened hair to, to wipe up the tears from his feet, she proceeds to pour her perfume on his feet, anointing them with oil. Perfume was highly prized in those days, extremely per- expensive. So she was giving Jesus through this ointment an expensive gift. It may have been the most precious thing she owned, we don't know, but she was pouring a lot of it now on him. Normally, it would have been used on the head, but with reverence and dignity and submission, she washes his feet, giving him the highest honor in the room. This is an astonishing expression of dignified, reverent, extravagant worship. And Jesus explains her actions to us in verse 47. I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. The woman reminds us that Not only does Jesus love us, he does love us. But his forgiveness has the power and is the basis of our love for Christ. How does Simon respond? Simon shows his response to both Jesus and the woman's actions with contempt. Now, that should surprise you, and that surprises me for this reason. The Pharisees and Jesus, you would think, would have gotten along much better. Jesus was poor, a common man, the son of a carpenter. The Pharisees were untrained. They were considered commoners. Although Simon may have been affluent, that was not the norm. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord, Isaiah 11 verse 3 says, meaning he kept the commands. The Pharisees meticulously kept the commands, particularly when it came to ceremonial cleanness and purity and tithing. You would have thought initially that Simon the Pharisee in inviting Jesus would have greeted him with honor as a prophet at the door with a kiss, with his servants washing his dirty feet as was customary. But instead he's ignored when he arrives and his feet remain dirty because Simon the Pharisee holds him in contempt. This religious leader of the day, this community leader, his attitude towards our Lord was judgmental, and it only deepens as he views the woman's actions towards him. Did you notice what he said to Jesus about the woman in verse Let me find it since I'm off of my notes. In verse 39, it's worth looking at. He says to his guests and to Jesus, if Jesus were a prophet, he would have known who this is and what sort of woman this is who is, there's the word, touching him. It's the same word Paul uses in Corinthians in the original to describe sexual immorality. Simon is saying her extravagant, 
really effusive, touchy affection towards you is not only publicly inappropriate, if she's a prostitute, are you one of her clients? You couldn't say something more disdainful and scornful and critical than that statement. The Pharisee assumed he was maintaining high moral standards in the service of God and his kingdom. And in having this woman enter his residence and in having Jesus not only permit but affirm her activity, he felt, he was convinced, his attitude was 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 solid and confirmed that what he and she were doing were completely against the laws of God and crossed a line that would render them both sinful. And so Jesus tells Simon this parable, the parable of the two debtors to remind him and to teach him and to instruct all, my second point. The parable reveals to us that Christ's work on the cross cancels all of our debts before God. The parable reveals that Christ's work on the cross cancels all of our debts before God. In verse 40, Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon was cautious. Uh, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. He was right. 500 denarii was nearly two years' wages, and anyone forgiven a debt that large would be grateful for a lifetime. Jesus said to him, verse 43, you judged rightly. But Jesus wasn't really talking about money, was he? This was not his version of the Dave Ramsey course and the importance of getting out of debt quickly. He applies his parable by talking first to the woman and talking about the great debt of our sin and the grace of God in Christ that cancels it. He says to Simon, do you see this woman? Of course he saw her. His attention has been riveted on her since she came to the dinner party. I entered your house, he says, you gave me No water for my feet, verse 44. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment, verse 46. Simon had done almost nothing for Jesus. He did not even fulfill the basic duties of of customary hospitality. But the woman treated Jesus with such dignity and reverence and extravagant love. What explanation could be offered? And Jesus tells Simon, her sins, verse 48, are forgiven. The tense of that statement, by the way, even though Jesus has not gone to the cross, means now, forever, finished, complete. Now, how you figure that out in light of the chronology, you can do that on your time. But when the Son of God says to someone, your sins are forgiven, that you can go to the house with. So what made the difference then? In her response, her dignified response, her reverent response, her extravagant response, she knew, she knew her sins were many. And God's grace in Christ had canceled them all. He believed 
His sins were few. And his love for God and his kingdom was fleeting. I think the point and the meaning of the parable raises a question for me and raises a question for you when it comes to my day-to-day relationship with God through Christ as those whom are today's disciples. If this parable reveals to us that Christ's work on the cross as a a substitute, as, as a lamb of God, as John the Baptist declared him, who bore not only our guilt and our shame, but who bore the penalty for our rebellion and sins against God. If Jesus the Christ died for your and my sins so that Today, as we were reminded during communion, and tomorrow, as we begin another week of work or or summer vacation or whatever we have in between, when it comes to my day-to-day relationship with God, do I tend to live out of a good day, bad day mentality when it comes to God's favor and blessing? Or do I live out of a reality of my debts are canceled. I'm free, even when the day doesn't go so good. Quick illustration, I have permission to share this, unlike most of my illustrations. Imagine you've spent the day gardening, which I don't do, all day. You're tired. You come inside, and you notice the load of wash that you put in not only didn't run, but there's water seeping out of the bottom of the washer for the upteenth time. While you're cleaning that up, you realize that your bones and your skin and your body aches from all the gardening, and the phone rings, and you pick up the phone, and it's a family member or friend that doesn't ask you how your day's going, but begins to dump on you how crummy their day has been going. Then, you try to go to sleep that night, and your body's so sore, and perhaps you had too much caffeine, you can't sleep. And in all that, this thought begins to kind of smuggle across your, God, did I do something wrong? Are you holding back on me? I thought we covered the bases this morning during quiet time, but this is a disaster. The next day, You get up, you have your quiet time, seemingly a good day. The aches have gone away, the the washer's fixed. Your husband's helping with the gardening. He's probably the handyman that fixed the washer. Someone calls and wants to know how you're doing, and at the end of the day, all of a sudden, your neighbor wants to talk to you about spiritual matters, and your confidence that God is with you in that moment emboldens you to share. That's a good day scenario. What do both of those scenarios have in common? They have in common a temptation that I face every day. And it's a temptation some of you face every day. That's how Simon tended to live out his every days. We forget that the foundation of this faith in Christ is not only rooted in the gracious character of God, but it is established and firm in the finished work of Calvary. Amen? So if my debts are canceled, then God's favor and blessing, as well as what he's testing and training me in, in days of difficulty, are not in any way connected to his acceptance, justification, pleasure, or love for me. He's testing me, he's training me, he's discipling me, but he's discipling me to put my faith where this woman had her faith, which is in the person of Christ alone his death, his resurrection, his reign, and his coming return. When I come into my day, the day relationship with God, and I begin to live out of a good day, bad day mentality where God's blessings on my life are incumbent primarily on something I do or don't do, friends, we need this story again, don't we? 
We need not only to say, I know it. We need to put ourselves in the story. You're Simon the Pharisee in that moment, and so am I. And we need to look at what Jesus says to the woman when he says, your sins are forgiven. Completely. And so whatever's going on circumstantially, it's not in any way tied up into or not whether I sinned or not. Yes, that's grace. That's God's favor at Christ's expense. That's the good news of Christianity. When I was raised in a Presbyterian church, I wasn't told that. I was told God's blessing on my life was based on what I did. Some of you were raised in Catholic settings and your merit was the basis of God's favor. Some of you were raised irreligiously and you're living as if superstitiously something you do or don't do is the basis of God's. But the gospel declares Our worst days, as Jerry Bridges says, are never so bad that they are beyond the reach of God's grace. Quote number three, Jim. And our best days are never so good that they are beyond the needs of God's grace. Every day our Christian experience should be a day of relating to God on the basis of Christ alone. Romans 5, 2, this grace comes through Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand hallelujah i never say that that's good news very good news as we comprehend the debts god has canceled through faith in christ as we reflect upon the willingness of god to forgive us our sins through Christ, we will love God and we will love honors more earnestly. Two closing thoughts and then, because I'm out of time. Sometimes even in Christian circles, sometimes even in church settings though, sometimes in my heart, I can, have you found yourself ever tempted by this? I can look scornfully on someone who's enthusiastic in their worship and celebration of Jesus. I'm more like the wife of David when David brought the ark back into the city of God. And he's rejoicing that the presence of God through this this ark has been restored, really the symbol of his abiding presence and covenant with the Old Testament people. And his wife, he says, who was a descendant of Saul, looks at his dancing before the Lord as scornful. Listen, Simon went to church all the time. He called it synagogue. He read his Bible all the time. He knew the Bible probably better than I did. But when he saw dignified, reverent, extravagant worship towards Jesus in light of this great death that's been canceled, his first reaction was scorn. It was contempt. It was distance. Friends, if and when our enthusiasm for the debt God has canceled in our life begins to wane, our responsiveness to what Jesus has done, our enthusiasm to what Jesus has done, our worship to what Jesus has done, it will show. So do you find during this pandemic, that your worship, your day-to-day worship of Christ is waning. Don't blame the pandemic. Look more deeply into the truths of the gospel and find in that reality the water your soul needs. And you'll find your playlist will change you'll find your love for God will begin to quicken. You'll find your need perhaps for another sermon during the week will grow. You'll find many expressions of, Lord, I love you out of this great love with which you've showed me too. One last thing. Lest we forget though, Simon wasn't just scornful towards Jesus. Simon was scornful towards Jesus' people too. 
He had no space for that woman. Hmm. I will be transparent. There are times when I look at what other Christians do in their worship of Christ, and rather than saying, praise God, there be a sinner like me saved by Calvary, I'm critical, I'm aloof, I might even say something on social media that would suggest I'm better because I'm different. You know, not that I do this often, but someone who's not as charismatic as me and dogmatic about the gifts don't exist today, I might say something critical. Someone who's more liturgical, whatever that means, I can't even spell the word, and I like more responsive. Someone who believes in a mode of baptism different than me. Someone, the list is endless, but I find myself sometimes looking with contempt at how people worship Jesus instead of looking inside my heart and say, wait a second. That sounds more like Simon. You know what the antidote for that is? It's the same antidote as the first. Remember that as we comprehend the debt God has forgiven us through faith in Christ, we will love God and others more earnestly. In fact, we will not only love fellow believers, we will love those who are lost. We will love those who are searching. We will love those like so many in our culture today that need to see this Jesus of Luke 7 in their world, demonstrating this kind of mercy and grace because of the gospel. Friends, if you've put your faith in Jesus and you've repented of putting your faith in any other work you do so that your confidence, not only today, but in the long tomorrow, is that I am saved through faith in Christ alone by the grace of God alone, Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Let's pray. Lord, there is salvation for everyone who puts their hope in Christ alone. Disciple us this week, Lord, anew in, in this parable of the kingdom. Bring back to our memory the lessons applied here, particularly during a bad day where we are tempted to view our circumstances as somehow an expression of your displeasure, rather, Lord, than looking at our life through the pleasure and glory of a Savior who is a friend of sinners and training us to trust in him every day. And Lord, as we see that and deepen in our awareness of that and grow in our responsiveness to it, Lord, help us be reverent, dignified, even extravagant in our love for you as well as for our love for neighbors too. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.